When we talked about plate girders last time, we started with this page, and I kind of given you some design equations, some equations to get you in the ballpark. Because what I'm going to recommend when you design a plate girder is, and it, it, this works really well, is to use these equations to get yourself in the ballpark and design something with like a compact web and a slender web with no stiffeners and then or a non-compact web and then a super slender web um, a super slender web with stiffeners okay so pushing it really pushing things so I'm, that's what I'm, I'm going to recommend that, that, that you do and that's what I asked you to do for your plate girder design and that's what I'm going to recommend is going to be a good practice when you go out and work in the real world we talked about each one of these equations um, these equations primarily or only apply for if you have a compact web these equations only apply if you have a non-compact or a slender web and remember these are only equations to get you in the ballpark Okay. They do not guarantee that they are going to work. They do not guarantee that they're going to provide the capacity. You still have to go through and check everything else. But they work a lot. And this equation, the minimum dead weight equation, is amazing. It is a great estimate whether you have rolled shapes, whether you have plate girders, whether you got compact webs or slender webs. Now, if you go and look at the derivation for it, you'd be like, Wow, I don't see how that could work that much. And I don't understand it either. Okay, I don't. No one else does either. But it seems to do a pretty good job. Okay, seems to do a pretty good job. <coughs> okay, so we said, hey, that's cool. Let's we'll start out with an example problem. We started doing that. And I finished the design for the compact web. And I even did the checks. Oh my gosh on one page. Pretty cool. Okay. And then you went into a non-compact web and this is without any stiffeners. Okay, so I'm going to follow this. This is a great outline for your project. Okay, fabulous outline for your project. If you're finding yourself awake because you haven't eaten enough turkey, you can totally start this. Okay, you can totally make big progress. But Knowing you, you'll probably be studying for your exam. But I understand that. If you get tired of that, you can start doing this. Okay? So, we get our H effective, our T web, our area flange. We come up with an estimate, a guess. Notice, when I did these things, I didn't iterate, I didn't change, I didn't look at anything. It's just a guess. And I find my dead weight. And I said, hey, I think I could be even more effective if H was equal to H effective, but I'm not going to worry about that. Remember, there was a restriction on the depth. Is there a restriction on the depth in your project? No. But I'll tell you what in life, almost everything known to man has a restriction to the depth. Whether it's bridges or buildings or whatever, everyone wants to rain on our parade, okay? And they never let us make it as deep as we want to. So enjoy yourself on this project. Okay, so after we come up with this, ugh, what is this junk? This is all of the checks to see if the design is okay. Check, 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 check. Where do I find all this information? Steel manual. Remember we talked about chapter G4, or G5, or those four and five chapters in the plate in that girder design? That's where all these equations come from. Okay? Okay. Slender web with stiffeners. Okay, I think this is about where we stopped last time. <coughs> and I said, hey, this time I'm going to keep the same depth and I'm going to drop the thickness to 3 8 for the web. I'm going to really, really push it. How did I find this? I looked at the last snail chart. I looked at the C V snail chart. And I pushed myself until I was slender. I pushed myself until I know I needed I really needed stiffeners. Okay? So we're going to use a 3 8 inch by 68 inch web. Area of the web, there's my H over T sub W. Here's my area of the flange. Since H over T sub W is 181, I go bump this up a little bit. I said, okay. So what I did is I said, you know what? I'm close to this slender zone. I'm going to bump this up a little bit. I'm going to make this a little bit larger. Okay? 
this a little bit bigger. Now I, 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 <clears throat> that's the one tweak I made. I have my area of my flange. And I start, this is all calcs now. This is all like capacity calculations. Which makes, because I did this, it makes a lot of the calculations easier. So I go through and do the calculations. I find out my capacity is okay. I calculate my dead weight, 290 pounds per foot. If you remember the last one was something like 320. The one before that is 308, 321, 308. 290, this is the lightest, and oh my gosh, look at this minimum dead weight formula. This thing is amazing. 292 pounds per foot. We're really, really close. Extremely close. Okay? So we've done a good job. I feel like we've done a good job. See, but hey, but how about the other ones? Why can't I optimize the other ones more? Well, the first one we did. Remember, we were forcing ourselves. To, say, to stay to have a compact web and a compact flange. We forced it to happen. So we were right at the edge of those compactness, and we're at 308. Now this one. Now I could have probably played with this one more. I probably could have played and tweaked and tried to get something a little bit better of a guess on, on this non-compact web with no stiffeners. The problem is that killed us is that... Um, we couldn't really get to this H effective. We couldn't really get to it having a deep girder. Okay? We were capped at our depth. Okay? So I know from experience that when you you're you're going to save money by your flange. I'm sorry. You're going to save weight by your web. Pardon me. You're gonna save weight by your web. That's just what you're gonna do. And if we're already set at a certain height that changing my flanges isn't going to change anything. And I've already got my web thickness chosen so that I'm right up against my, my limit. Okay? So there's not really anything else I can do. I mean, I could tweak the flanges a little bit, but that really won't change the weight that much. Okay? So, 321. Now, that's cool. It's a lot of math I just blew through. And then I did some stiffener design. And I said, hey, remember, in our last panel, we cannot use tension field action. Extreme hint for the test in your homework. Don't forget this. So I said, okay, I'm going to solve for and use this, I'm going to solve for this, this, the shear stress in the web. Um, and I'm going to use H over T sub W, and then I get this A over H. What am I doing here? I'm using that magical chart that's worth the cost of the steel manual alone. Remember that magical chart? Had all those things coming down for stiffener designs? Should be using it on your homework due tomorrow. Anyway, so we get A over H from the chart. And I have my H is already given, so I get my A about 40.8. I'm going to use about 40 inches. Now, that's my spacing. That's A. A is my stiffener spacing. That's my spacing at the end. How about after the end? I can use tension field action. It's a different chart. Remember that? It's a different chart. I can use tension field action. So I'm going to go 40 inches away from the end, or one stiffener away from the end. And this is just using a linear reduction. Just basically, I'm just looking at the shear diagram. Find out that I, that's my shear is 323 kips. And I do everything again, but I use a different chart this time. How come? Because I can use tension field action. Or at least I'm assuming I can use tension field action. Remember, there's about three assumptions you have to satisfy even after you hit this magical endpoint that you have to still satisfy. 95 inches or less until point loads. So I go, no stiffeners needed between the point loads. Hmm, no stiffeners needed between the point loads? Why not? Well, look at the shear diagram. Look at the shear. It's almost nothing. It's almost no shear in between the point loads. Not very high. You could actually just get away with just the web capacity itself. Okay? 
Now, I'll tell you, in real life, what, what will happen? They'll put the stiffeners everywhere. They'll start the stiffeners at a spacing, and they won't stop the stiffeners. They'll keep them moving the entire length all the way across. They may change the first one, first in spacing, then it'll be the constant spacing all the way across till it hits the last one. That's what people commonly do. Okay. Now, if you're making 200 of these, then maybe you want to leave those stiffeners out. However, <coughs> we're assuming these loads are constants, and loads in real life are not constant. You may have a one high and one and one, and one would be low, which would totally change your shear diagram, which would likely necessitate stiffeners in the middle. And that's why you have to look at pattern loading. You know what I'm talking about. Pattern loading, like that live load, and de live load isn't constant everywhere. Okay, it may be only over here or only in the middle or only on the side because that's what people do. They like to walk around. Okay, they don't like to just stick in one place. Make sense? Okay. But if we solve the problem as is written, you technically don't need any stiffeners in between the point loads. <coughs> so I'm going to use three stiffeners at 68 inches. Why did I use 68 inches? Because the math worked out nicely. Put a stiffener underneath the point load, which is always a good idea. One, two, three, spacing. I have 36 inches of spacing at the end. This is just basically figuring out what fits. Okay? Okay. Now I do my stiffener size calcs. I'll be honest with you. I did not include some of the most recent stiffener sizing equations that are in the 14th edition of the manual and not in the 13th edition. Okay? Those should be in there. Okay? So, I'll just write a note to you. Include all stiffener sizing equation. I think there's only one that I left out. Okay, so I found a stiffener, two and a half inch um, by a quarter, two and a half inch coming out each side. Why didn't I, I and, and oftentimes people would go ahead and take these stiffeners all the way to the edge of the flange, okay? It's very common to do that, but we're going to leave it short because I'm trying to save money. So what did we do? When I designed my compact web, here's my web dimensions, here's my flange dimensions, there's my weight per foot. Same thing for these these other um, scenarios. So one may look at this and be like, wow, look at this. It's lighter, therefore it's cheaper, right? Uh, not necessarily. Notice that when your web gets non-compact, your flange size has to increase significantly. Okay, wow, look at that. 15 inches compared to 11 inches. Big difference, big difference. But hey, look, we're still saving weight. So that's good, right? Well, Let's talk about welds. Depending on how exact your cost analysis is, the welds can play a significant role, especially on these designs. Because there's a lot more welds on these designs than there are on all the other ones. So, I explain here how to design the longitudinal welds. And I talk about just the stiffeners, I use a minimum, I use a minimum weld dimension. Um, or a, I think I use the same weld dimension as I used for the longitudinal welds. Um, I go recall from strengths that um, the shear required per inch is VQ over I, and I found my Q, and I found my I, and I found my shear flow, my strength I need per inch, and I'm basically plugging this into my design equation. There's two sides, 1.4 kips per inch for an E70 electrode, L is I'm doing it per inch length, and I'm solving for D, and I get one and a half. Of course, there's no beta term, which is bad of me. Should include the beta term, the beta reduction factor.
But that 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 would be smart to do. But if we remember the beta reduction factor is capped at 0.6, okay? So even if I had to double this in size, 4 sixteenths, since my top flange is 2 inches thick, the minimum size weld I can get away with is 5 sixteenths of an inch. It doesn't matter what my point is. Beta reduction factor won't control, even if it's at the most extreme it possibly can be. Okay? So, and I said, hey, since I'm using 5 sixteenths of an inch, and again, we're talking about the welds here, 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 here. Right? Because we have to hook those plates together. They don't just magically stick together. Synthetic electricity is not that strong. Right? Friction is not something I want to rely on to hold plates together. It never work. Got to weld them together. I said, hey, since I'm using 5 16 cents there, I'll go ahead and use 5 16 stitch in, the in, in, in these. That really means, I mean, why I would do something like that is this weld would have to be 5 16 of an inch. I'm welding to my top flange and my top flange is thick. This size weld could be smaller if I wanted to. Okay? I could do that. Okay? And probably in a real shop you would. And probably in a real design place you would. I just left the 516. So it's all the same. Okay? If you have a human doing this, you'd say like, well, if this weld's 516, I don't want them to get confused. So I'm going to make this weld 5 sixteenths as well. Maybe make it a stitch weld. You with me? Awesome. So let's do this total cost analysis. And this is something that you are going to be expected to do <coughs> on your project. So it's very tough to know what is the best beam cross section to make the job the most economical. There can be tons of constraints way more constraints than have to do with this cost analysis and your job may have these constraints and may cause something else to be done than what would be the cheapest for example there's play there's constraints placed on height or length or weight if you have cranes okay the boom their boom length versus weight is really 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 important you want to park those cranes, and you don't want to move them, and you want to use them as much as possible. You might say to yourself, why would I ever think about this? I'm an engineer. I just designed these things. Yeah, you're right. But everything in the world is going more towards design build, where the contractor and the engineers actually work together. And now you're both working together to try to solve a solution, and this stuff is huge in design build. Okay? Also, you need to make sure you give people options and ideas on, on how they're going to build your structure. Okay, so if we assume steel costs are finished steel, you can probably buy steel today for about a buck to a buck and a half a pound for the raw steel. If we say finished steel, I mean cut, all the burrs taken off, all, you know, taken from large plates, cut down to small plates, all kinds of things like that. Um, all the handling that goes into that, about five cent, five dollars a pound is a good estimate. At least it was in 2009, and I still think it's a pretty good estimate today. Okay, the welding slash inspecting costs are fifty dollars per foot. Okay, weld certified welders are not cheap. Inspections of weld is not cheap. Okay, this number may be a bit high, but it's not that far off. Okay, it's not that far off depending on what the inspection technique they use. And again, you will hear people say all the time, every weld we do is inspected. And then you need to ask them, what type of inspection do you use? And they'll come down to the answer is visual. And I would like, I would hope so. I mean, wouldn't you hope you would visually inspect everything you make? I mean, it'd be like, I made every bird bot, every, uh, every uh, birdhouse I make is inspected. Oh yeah? I look at it. I'd hope so, right? You want to make sure that the roof is on right, right, and things like that. So yeah, we're talking about non-destructive testing here, okay? We're talking about either radiographs or um, ultrasonic testing. And for most jobs, those are required. For most bridge, jo bridge jobs, 
that's required. Okay, so this one with the compact web, we have our weight and then we have our welds. Welds, yeah, 60 feet times four times 50, that, that's 12 grand in welds, okay? It's $92,400 in steel, total is 104, a little over 104K for that girder, okay? So we'll go to the non-compact web, we're at 108. It's more, not ec as economical as the other one. And then we go with our slender web. And our slender web starts looking to be really exciting. Because at first we say, wow, $87,000 for the web. That's awesome. Oh yeah, i got to add those stiffeners in. Believe it or not, they cost $1,000 for the stiffeners. Okay? Here to 88. 88 is still less than 92.4. Okay, looking like it's going to be good. Oh, yeah, welds. We got the $12,000 for the welds, and we have $11,000 for the stiffener welds. $11,000 for the stiffener welds. When you add this up, this ends up being the most costly of all. So, compact web is most economical. What? The one that took me one page to design was the most economical. But I didn't know that until I went to the other hellacious seven pages, right? Okay. Design philosophy. Plate girder design is tough because at the off outset, it's difficult to know whether it's best to use compact or a slender web. It's hard to know. Therefore, really, one must design both and see which one works best for your application. Also, notice that there were several times during the design process where I may have been able to optimize a flange or a web further, but I didn't because it's unclear if that configuration will control. Now, what I mean by this is after I've realized this compact web is the cheapest, by around $4,000, which $4,000 is around 4% difference. 4% is what separates number one from number two. Okay? Not much. Not much at all. <clears throat> and this one probably would have been better if I could have made it deeper for this application. Um, but 4% is what the difference was. However, now I can go back and tweak these. Okay? I can tweak this, see if I can, if I can minimize that flange a little bit. Okay? I can tweak this if I wanted to, see if I can minimize that stuff. If I want to try to tweak this, I'll tell you the number one thing I want to do is minimize welds. Because the welds are kicking my tail. At least the welds on the stiffeners are kicking my tail. Okay. So, I didn't iterate because I didn't know which one w was going to control. Now I can go back. Now that I know which one's going to control, I can go back and I can start to iterate. Keep in mind that that um, you're not by iterating, you're not going to save usually more than one percent more. Okay, so it might not be worth your time. One to two percent more. So. Um, after the process is over, one can go back and optimize the design further. When designing for a slender web, try reducing the web thickness to come close to the minimum deadweight formula. Find flanges that make moment capacity work, very stiff inner space, and so that the capacity is satisfied. So I say this at the bottom. Finding the most economical section. By economical section, I mean um, cheapest. Finding the cheapest section will not bring you fame or fortune. You will not become famous for finding the cheapest girder. But if you can find it quickly, you can become famous. Because you can make a lot of money. If you can do it quick. It's about speed. Okay? It's about getting to an answer quickly. It's about understanding what the boundaries are, getting a first really good guess, going with that guess and 
evaluating it, see how it performs, maybe tweaking it a little bit more. Okay. On the end here, I just have some um, places where I've, we've, I've derived some of these equations. Um, one of the very interesting ones is this dead weight one. It's, very, it's pretty cool. Um, that is it for plate critters. Do you have any questions?